So, uh, Kat used to have pictures. Uh, I, I'm from Cleveland, as mentioned, and uh, uh, she would have conversations with me. We would be walking. She'd be walking around showing me not data, but actually what the view was outside. So. <laughs> Uh, I am a neuro-oncologist, um, and as you can see uh, from my data in a few minutes, that uh, I have a short attention span, um, and so we're going to hit a couple different areas. But brain tumors are actually an area that um, is really a prominent problem that we have in um, not just cancer in general, uh, but in fact, as we get successful in systemic cancers, uh, we're going to see more and more failure in the CNS. And so the, the numbers are rather striking. So uh, right now, uh, almost 700,000 people alive uh, today with uh, a brain tumor of some type. And um, these are divided into benign and malignant, but one of the things that some of the benign tumors are not quite so benign. Um, this area has received a great deal of attention recently uh, with uh, uh, glioblastoma is uh, one of the areas that are, are really a major problem. So this is the most prevalent uh, malignant brain tumor uh, primary to the brain. And obviously um, it uh, <laughs> has had a major impact so far on our uh, healthcare system. Uh, Ted Kennedy uh, developed his at an inopportune time and then uh, obviously there's a, an issue of of things, but what we really want to do is, is make it so that we stop losing senators from uh, glioblastoma. Um, <clears throat> uh, anyway, so this has really become an area that is uh, uh, very exciting, um, in part because of work. Uh, Tanisha Dorea was, um, who you'll hear from later this afternoon, one of the pioneers in really understanding that cancers like glioblastoma have in them stem-like populations. Um, and this is, uh, you've already seen this picture from Kat in terms of The Economist. Uh, this was something that came out not that long after we had made some contributions to the field. Uh, and this has really led the community to think about drugs and drug in these populations. And one of the challenges with cancer stem cells is defining these. And so like normal stem cells, they are defined functionally. And these have capabilities of, for example, tumor initiation, uh, the ability to self-renew. There are a lot of different markers or approaches that are taken, and some of these you'll hear about later this afternoon. But one of the challenges is that we don't have anything, if you're thinking about a clinical trial design, there's nothing that's an absolute indicator other than these kind of functional assays, which are really labor-intensive, to really think about success. In addition, one of the things that uh, I have tried to push is the fact that what really challenges us in cancer therapy is not just straight proliferation. Obviously, proliferation is important, but if we just had a localized tumor that was strictly proliferating, uh, that would be a much more curable entity. Um, whereas, on the other hand, things like uh, tumor spread, whether it be metastatic or invasive, the immune component and angiogenesis are really strong issues with regard to uh, oncology. And one of the things we have to remember about, and we've heard a little bit about this already, is the fact that these cells live in a location. So normal stem cells are the most dangerous populations. And so what happens is in the normal system, there's kind of what I like to call a velvet prison. So the stem cells are coddled, but if they leave that area, they either undergo terminal differentiation or they die. And so some years ago, one of the things that um, I helped to uh, think about with Richard Gilbertson, who's now at Cambridge, is the fact that there were a great deal of parallels in terms of the microenvironment where these uh, cells lived between the normal cells, for example, the normal neural stem cells. Uh, and they, these cells, we already know, have a relationship with blood vessels, with the extracellular matrix, and with a differentiated progeny. And we proposed, based on some work that each of our groups had done, that there was a similar phenotype with regard to um, cancer stem cells as well. And what I can tell you is that, and I'm going to show you some data today, but in large part uh, there's some things that are ongoing that uh, hopefully will be available soon. You know, one of the questions is, if cancer stem cells are so wonderful, why isn't every cell in the tumor a cancer stem cell? And it's because there's actually an organ system that has to be created. So the significance, though, we had shown, as I mentioned uh, now, um, more than 10 years ago that these cancer stem cells were therapeutically resistant. This was the first report in any uh, solid tumor. 
and that also that these uh, cells are driving angiogenesis. And so these back-to-back -back kind of papers um, really kind of set the tone for my group to understanding the contribution of these cells to, to therapy. So uh, I'm going to just show you some very recent work. Uh, <clears throat> obviously, organoids are something that we're all very enamored of, and uh, the idea of organoids as a system to translate into disease was something that one of my postdoctoral fellows decided to embark on, and so uh, we uh, reported the first brain tumor organoids. And <clears throat> there are a lot of data that uh, we've generated, but I'll just show you a couple of the highlights. One is the sphere culture system that has been used and pioneered really uh, in the neural stem cell community, uh, but subsequently used for lots of other solid tumors, um, has been proposed as being a very good system to maintain phenotypes from brain tumors and other cancer types. But the reality is if we take these cells and we put them in a brain, it turns out that they behave in a way that does not recapitulate the primary tumor. Whereas what we see is an organoid system, even if you disaggregate these cells to single cells, retain more of that phenotype. And in fact, one of the interesting things, among many issues, is that uh, you can even take a single patient biopsying different regions, create separate organoids, and these organoids retain phenotypes uh, that were present in the original tumor. So we leverage these ideas overall that the cells that are behaving differently in different areas uh, may have different phenotypes. And we uh, just uh, several weeks ago, we reported doing an in vivo versus in vitro shRNA screen for epigenetic regulators. So the idea is pretty simple. That is, what we're going to do is try and see what makes cells tick in a dish versus in a mouse. <clears throat> and so we had a head-head comparison, and this was a, a huge challenge. Uh, but essentially... Um, what we found uh, were several shocking points. One is exactly opposite to what I predicted. The number of dependencies that we found in a mouse was much greater than what was in a dish. Okay? So there are a lot of opportunities that we may be missing if we were looking in a dish. But the other thing that was really shocking is that these hits were almost entirely non-overlapping. So probably 99.9 some percent of screens have been done in a dish. And these suggest, and it's not to say that they're wrong, but they are, uh, <laughs> it is that there are phenotypes that we are missing and molecular targets that we're missing. And the thing that was really fascinating is that these hits converged not on random areas, but actually on a particular biologic regulation. And so, uh, something that you'd like to just say every day, enhance immediate pause release elongation initiation. Um, so basically it's transcriptional uh, uh, progresses uh, that are specific for certain transcripts. And <clears throat> what we see here is everything in red is specific for an in vivo situation. The blue is the single shared uh, entity of both in vitro and in vivo. And we, we see that there's a, this convergence. And um, Everything in white was not tested, but I'll show you, for example, over here we had a report uh, last year where we saw the PTFB complex was uh, specific for cancer stem cells in vivo, and then we also had a report on, on FACT itself. Um, and just to show you, we did a lot of different uh, studies, and I'm not going to go through these, but if we did uh, H3K27 acetyl chip seq as well as RNA-seq, what we can actually see is that there's a real dichotomization in cell biology in a dish and in vivo. And in a dish, basically, the cells are just going through mitosis, and they are metabolizing like crazy. They're not having to make any cell decisions, whereas in vivo, there are uh, much greater complexity. And one of the things that was interesting was we could go through and look at other people's data that they weren't looking at this, but basically validated entirely independently uh, the same sort of findings. And just to show you, again, there are a lot of, a lot of data I'm not going to go through, but this really poses some real challenges for those of us who are thinking about uh, looking at things in a dish. Because if you take, for example, we had done shRNAs, but if you take guide RNAs and CRISPR out three of the main molecular targets in a dish, they're dispensable. But when you put these in a mouse, now they're dependent. And it really suggests you uh, need to think about how you do these assays. And so one of the things we're trying to do is come back around and say, can we use the organoid system to ask some of these questions? And one of the things that we're doing, too, is it turns out the inside and the outside of the organoid are very different. And so we're labeling these and segregating uh, based on um, 
fact sorting and, and die uptake. Uh, so uh, we have different uh, dependencies we see. But just to show you, we do see a greater overlap if these same uh, kinds of screens are performed in the organoid in vivo, uh, but they're not identical. So what we're trying to do is do some mass production. Uh, I like to show these because they remind me when I was growing up of those little candies that you'd pop off and eat. Um, and uh, so, uh, but I would not suggest eating these because they probably don't taste very good. Um, so really the in vivo environment is important from these kind of screens, but the question is, is it important therapeutically? And in a paper coming out of Nature Medicine on Monday, what we can show in partnership with a neurosurgeon is the answer is yes. And these are uh, two main molecular targets that people have gone after in terms of the epigenetic field, BMI1 and EZH2. And so in partnership with a neurosurgeon, what we did is we took patient tumors and uh, he went and biopsied different regions. What we see is the central dark zone is a necrotic region, which has some dead tissue, but it's also highly inflammatory. Uh, the white area of uh, that rim is a highly vascular region where there's a disruption of the blood-brain barrier, and then there's some dark regions. And the long and the short of this is what we can see is that they're fundamentally different populations of cancer stem cells in the same patient in different regions, and these are predictable. And so we started looking at the epigenetic regulation, and uh, many of you have heard of the poly polycomb repressive complexes. And these uh, are kind of shared entities that are thought to act sequentially, PRC1, then PRC2 activity to induce uh, chromatin compaction. And uh, EZH2 is a component of PRC2, uh, and BMI1 a component of PRC1. And so one of the things we can do is go and stain for the post-translational modifications and we see, again, there's a dichotomization. In areas where there's enhancement, what we see is that there isn't uh, the um, histone mark, the H3K27 trimethyl. Um, uh, uh, and this is actually a mistake here. I apologize. Uh, this is, should be H2AAK119 uh, ubiquitin. Um, so there's just basically dichotomization. And one of the things we did is a, a sequential uh, chip-seq uh, analysis straight out of the tumor, and we can see biologic processes differ. Further, what we can do is we can take cancer stem cells that have two different phenotypes, and we can see that there's a complete difference in dependence. So you say, this is wonderful, cells in a dish, who cares? But it actually turns out that when we use these same uh, approaches, we have these two inhibitors. This is a BMI1 inhibitor and an EZH2 inhibitor, and some of these inhibitors are in clinical trial. And what you can see is that uh, the BMI1 inhibitors target these blue cells much better, and the EZH2 inhibitors target these uh, red cells much better. And basically what this is telling us is there's a dichotomization of chromatin targeting. Um, and so we took an obvious approach, and that is combining these. And we also see this in vivo. Um, and so you're left with this model system where cells that are cancer stem cells in the same patient in different locations are regulated differently and this has direct therapeutic implications. So the question is, how can we go after uh, all these different cell types? Um, and so one crazy approach we've taken relates to Zika. So everyone's heard of Zika, um, and uh, we'll hear probably more about it later today, but um, this has really gained the attention. And one of the things that was really kind of interesting to us was that, was that although there are in adults some phenotypes, uh, they're relatively modest. And further, there's an observation that the phenotypes fetally uh, are largely due to the fact that neuroprogenitors and neural stem cells are being targeted. And so a postdoctoral fellow of mine asked the question, could we leverage these findings uh, to target glioma stem cells? And so this is a paper that just came out and received uh, uh, some attention. Um, this was kind of a hit-you-over-the-head kind of set of observations. So right off the bat, when we started growing glioma stem cells, when we infected them with Zika, uh, there was a very, very strong immediate ability uh, to target the populations that were cancer stem cell-like. And so here's a very interesting set of findings. So they, these are two different strains of Zika, Brazilian and, and one from Dakar. And what you can see is that when you treat glioma stem cells with these, you're killing them very potently. But interestingly, the differentiated tumor cells, so these are the, the same genetic background, they really don't have any efficacy against Zika. 
um, or Zika doesn't have efficacy against them. And this is in contrast to another flavovirus, um, West Nile virus, that had been used as a therapy but had a huge toxicity. Um, and so we just went through a lot of different studies, and one of the things we started to do uh, was to quantify the effects. So what we see is we're really depleting the cancer stem cells very specifically with Zika. We took these organoids, basically you blow up organoids if you treat with uh, Zika. And we also took human brain tumor slices. We had to FedEx these down from Cleveland to, to Wash U. And basically you see that without even any culture, the cells that you're infecting are the glioma stem cells. And just to show you that the immune system is actually functional, I actually hate the immune system. It's scary. I don't understand it. Uh, <laughs> but I assume it's necessary. Um, <laughs> what we can see is that, uh, unlike the brain, which is much more interesting, but um, what we can see is that actually it, um, one of the challenges in this whole field is that the regular Zika we use actually doesn't work very well in mice. And so in collaboration, what we used is kind of a, a, a pseudotype Zika that was passed through mice. And so the beautiful thing is you have a very, very strong control. So you have the regular Zika that has absolutely no potency, but that uh, potency is dramatically increased if you have these that are now pseudotyped for the mouse. And so they start killing the cells, and these are all uh, murine glioma cell lines, and uh, they don't target the normal murine cells. And we can see some in vivo efficacy. Um, <clears throat> One of the things that we did was we tried to ask the question, why was there this difference in efficacy um, between the stem and the differentiated cells? And we found the ISGs, these interferon response genes, uh, to be one of the strong differential targets. And so we used a mutant form that only hits uh, cells that have um, resistance to interferons. And what we can see is that uh, we have a greater selectivity uh, against the glioma stem cells. And so this came out, it was co covered by a whole lot of different uh, groups. Um, we don't actually dress like this, um, but uh, this is the contribution um, from Forbes magazine of, of covering things. Uh, but basically the exciting thing is that we can pay attention to nature. Nature tells us here's a way that you can target cells very specifically. Evolution is much more powerful than any gene targeting strategy we have. And so viruses tell us a lot. So uh, in, in conclusion, uh, what I would say is that uh, everything we do is uh, dependent on uh, the patients giving of themselves. And so we really appreciate the patients um, uh, uh, for everything they do. So thank you very much. Happy to answer questions later.